My name is Mason Marangella. I build rigs for the industry's top professionals. Now I'm teaching guitarists how to build rigs like the pros with DIY tips, easy mods, and all the tricks of the trade. I am the Rig Doctor. Gonna get into it. Hey guys, let's just get a quick sound check here. If you can let me know in the comments section whether you are hearing everything okay, that will be helpful. Just to make sure that we're good. Everybody who's over on YouTube or Instagram or Facebook, we have lots of different things coming in. I'm just going to make sure on Facebook that we can actually see our comments here. Um, we're doing the principal live stream happening over on YouTube, so we've provided links or swipe ups in the stories so that you can join us on YouTube. That's the most interactive experience if you want that. If you prefer to stay on Instagram or on Facebook, you're completely welcome to. You just may be completely lost when I'm referencing things that are coming up on the screen on YouTube because that's where a lot of the questions are generated. So we just need to let you know that so you're not confused. I'll periodically repeat this, so I'm sorry for those of you who are staying for the entirety. Just as a housekeeping measure, I want to let you know that. So if I'm referencing stuff on this screen over here, that's because that's where the primary questions are coming in. I also have Mejia here helping me do some of this stuff. So he will be directing me. I just got back from Los Angeles literally a couple of hours ago, but I've been traveling all over the place. I was in, from, as you can see from the hat, uh, the good guys over at uh, Chicago Music Exchange hooked me up with a few pieces of apparel. I have a sweatshirt now, I have a hat, I have a t-shirt now. Uh, some of you have been telling me that my t-shirts are too tight, so this may fit better, so we'll see. Um, <laughs> so, um, but in, in any case, yeah, I was at Sweetwater last week, Chicago Music Exchange. We just released a video today with Isaiah Sharkey uh, with one of the builds that we did over there. We were doing a collaboration with Bestronics and we had originally planned just to do one build, which was with uh, Danny Rabin from Marvin. And that video came out uh, exactly, I think, one week from today. And we featured some new products. We have our new Vertex pedal boards that uh, we kind of piloted with him. And um, this is made by the same company, Fix Pedal Boards, that makes all of our risers. But they're actually going to be releasing a Vertex line of, of pedal boards through them, which they are going to fulfill. And then we are, you know, kind of uh, helping to do the, the marketing side of that, but it's completely designed with us. Originally, we were gonna do this through Get Off My Case, but I think Get Off My Case's focus is, is a little bit more wide and, and really where they get their income sources. Pedal boards are a very small component of that, and I think fixed pedal boards was just a little bit better fit for where we wanted to go long-term um, in working with the, the companies that we do. And so we're trying to figure out the sizes right now of exactly what we want to do. We'd love your feedback on that if you want to add that into the comments at any point as far as sizes and uh, that you think we should be having. But we're really trying to distill it to the principal sizes that you would find in a Pelican Air case, um, things like that, and really not trying to meet the fringe sort of needs of people like really huge sizes or really tiny sizes trying to kind of keep it to the, the sizes that we would build. And we'll have lots of instructional videos on exactly how to build them most efficiently. So that'll kind of be a key differentiator between, say, like Pedal Train and some of the other pedal board manufacturers. I'm happy to let them have that business. I'm really just focused on kind of what's really practical for traveling, what's really practical to actually take on a plane, and that's going to survive a trip or TSA or those sorts of things. So... Um, that's kind of uh, some housekeeping stuff, and we have a cool video that's going to be coming out with Isaiah Sharkey um, through Chicago Music Exchange. I think on Monday is the scheduled day, and it's with um, Nathaniel, who a lot of you who are familiar with Chicago Music Exchange, you've probably seen him show up on their feed on Instagram lots of times. And he and Isaiah are kind of doing an interview where they're both playing the Steel String MK2, which is our newest pedal that's, you know, just like the Steel String, just... You know, a third smaller uh, adds a jazz rock toggle switch so you can get some bass cut out of it, which is one of the complaints that some people had. And uh, just it's going to be a great video. If you look on our Instagram, you can see uh, that on the IGTV side. I think it's already got like 25,000 views um, on Instagram, which is pretty good for, for our metrics on Instagram at least. 
Um, and so that'll be a really cool video, and it's like an interview and a couple of playing examples. So look forward to that on uh, Chicago Music Exchange's YouTube channel. And again, this is just a reminder to everybody who's on uh, Facebook or on Instagram. The principal component of what we'll be doing will be here on YouTube. So when you see me looking this direction, that's because I'm addressing people on this screen primarily. Although if you do have questions, please type them in. I have Mejia here helping me, so he will redirect these questions so that we can answer them to the wider audience. So um, I'm going to get into kind of this, the talk about buffers and then kind of maybe the last quarter of the time that we have here, I'll go through individual questions that, that are coming up. And, and Mejia, if you see anything coming up on uh, YouTube or on Facebook or Instagram that you think needs to be, you know, updated, um, you know, we can definitely make sure that you know, we do that and we kind of get involved sooner than later if it's something that needs to happen just to make sure that we get to everything that we need to. Um, so let's, uh, let's get into it. So the, the impetus for this is that last week when I was at Sweetwater, uh, we did a, 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 what they call a lunch and learn where you go to Sweetwater and you buy the sales engineers there lunch. And if you have a sales engineer, Definitely use them at Sweetwater. It's an amazing company, um, as is Chicago Music Exchange. And what we were doing with them is kind of giving them some instructions around uh, products that they carry within the Sweetwater store, but that they could use to upsell to their customers to really help them have the benefit of, of improving the tone of their pedal boards. And one of the challenges is, is that there are so many buffers out there, and a lot of us consider buffers as equal. Somebody says, well, I have a buffer on my pedal board, so I don't need one. The presumption is, is that if you just have this, a thing called a buffer, that that means that it encompasses the quality of all buffers that exist. It would be like saying, well, I wear a size 12 shoe, so you should wear a size 12 shoe too. We, we, we all have shoes, they're all the same size. And it, it doesn't work that way. The, with buffers, in fact, I would say that there's really only a handful on the entire market that are actually of a professional quality. So I'm going to go over a couple of different ones that I think are the best at buffering and tell you why and also the strategic placements you need to put buffers and then maybe contingencies where you may not want to have buffers. Uh, I just thought of another thing Mejia that we need to get a fuzz face image because that's, that's we'll talk about our contingencies, uh, another one of our contingencies for no input buffer. Um, so just want to kind of give you the lay of the land before we get into it. I'm going to be bringing in some slides. And if you find it to be disruptive, as I'm kind of going through this, to bring in these slides, and you'd rather me just be telling you I can do that, but I think the slides will help illustrate some of the broader points that we're going to be covering today. And so I'm kind of putting on my teaching hat, and I will try to keep it as interesting and fast-paced as I can. And if there is questions that kind of come in as we go, Mahi is going to be monitoring that if there's good places for us to stop or start. And again, if you're over on Instagram or you're over on Facebook, I invite you to come over to YouTube and we're going to be addressing a lot of the questions that kind of are coming in here and kind of creating a more interactive experience. So we've, we've given links in uh, Facebook, we've got swipe ups in our stories on, on Instagram, so feel free to join us over here if you'd like to participate in kind of the primary component of the conversation. So just a, an intro, we're going to be talking about buffers. This is just kind of pulling from some of the slides I used over at um, Sweetwater. That, uh, that I created there in kind of a PowerPoint format. So we're talking about buffers. And the first thing that I want to be doing today with buffers is, is kind of talk to you about the, uh, where the best place is to put them. So I'm going to kind of have for you just like this sample pedal layout. So this, I, I think I took it from Strymon or somebody else's website where they just kind of had a fictitious signal path that they were kind of using. And I'm not using it to, to illustrate anything that they were. I think it's just to help me show you where buffers are. So that we have this, this Rickenbacker guitar here. There's a compressor, a wah, an overdrive, a chorus, um, a tremolo, a volume pedal, a delay, reverb, and then amp. And the only thing that I would say that is objectionable at all about this is that 
the length between the, the 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 reverb cable and the amp is probably way longer than that typically you would have the longest cable between those two points so just keep that in mind when you're looking at that very uh, last arrow that's going from the blue reverb into kind of the charcoal gray amp that if that were illustrated sort of more to scale that would be a much longer cable but for the purposes of this I think you can follow me so far so basically the thing that I've been touting in a lot of the videos that we've we've put up is the need for high quality buffers which there are very few of there's lots of companies that make something called a buffer but its effectiveness at doing that is actually not that effective um, so the thing that I, I encourage all of you to look at when you're looking at buffers and evaluating their efficiency because really a buffer should be a one-to-one -one amplifier so whatever goes into it it should represent that going out of it so long as you're not turning on another pedal so presuming that everything in our fictitious signal chain here is true bypass it should sound the same if it's properly buffered as if that guitar were plugged into the amplifier with nothing else in between if the quality of your buffers are doing their job there should be no difference in tone between the guitar plugged directly into that amplifier at the end of the signal path as it is with everything in between that's the best case scenario that means it's not coloring the tone now in order to do that you need a certain minimum number of buffers to really make it happen effectively I'm going to talk about that in a minute but the thing that I really want you to know about is the specification that you're going to be looking for when you're going out and looking at your own buffers and which ones you might want to buy you're going to be looking at the specification so this is one I pulled off of TC Electronics website and this is one of the only buffers that I've found, other than the others that I'm going to mention today, that actually discuss what their input and output impedance is. So here it's 1 meg ohm and 100 ohm on the output. So 1 meg ohms on the input and 100 ohms on the output. So if we're looking at the bona fide buffer, which is right here, that means when you plug into it, it's seen 1 meg. That's a very typical uh, input impedance that you would see whenever you are plugging into any tube amplifier. So if it's a Fender amp, if it's a Marshall amp, almost every single amp that you can imagine that you likely engage with on a day-to-day -day basis, that's almost invariably going to be one meg on the input, no matter what. So this is why that's important, because your guitar is going to plug into that buffer first. So you want your guitar to feel and, and believe you know, internally in its circuit, to the degree to which circuits can believe anything, that it's seeing the input of an amplifier because the way that we're used to our pickups reacting are as though we're plugging a 10-foot cable, let's say, into the front of the amp. So the buffer controls that pickup loading, gives the pickups what it wants to see. This is presuming they're passive. We'll talk about active pickups a little bit later. And then it's converting the signal to an ultra-low impedance. And, and really, I think a, a good way to understand the word impedance, if you're not sure what that means, is just sensitivity. If something's really high impedance, that means it's very sensitive to the environments that it's in. Changes environments that can change the, how predictable that the, the product actually reacts, how it, it behaves in certain environments. If it's really low impedance, it means it's not really that sensitive. So you can put it in through different conditions, and if it's low impedance, it's likely not going to be very sensitive to the things around it, the environment with which it's in. So the cool thing about buffers, you know, converting the signal to low impedance after that one meg input, is that it makes everything that it run in, runs into less susceptible to problems environmentally. So you like to think of the buffer, or I like to think of the buffer, as sort of a firewall that isolates, at least on the input, the guitar from the pedal board. But that's just one of the things that it does. You also need to have a buffer at the end of the signal path. So we're going back to my fictitious pedal board layout. And not only are we putting a buffer at the beginning, you can see here I just added in a bona fide buffer right after the guitar, the guitar that's an input buffer, but I also put one at the end after the reverb because as soon as you have any bona fide or any buffer of any kind going in, whether it's a bona fide or one of the other ones we're going to talk about, it's only effective to the point that you turn on one of these pedals. So if I turn on my compressor, let's say, which is the pedal that's right after that input buffer, and that's mostly on or an always on pedal for me, that means that my buffer is only effective until any pedal is turned on or I run into another buffer. So that could be a buffer in a pedal or that could be another dedicated buffer. If this compressor, even if it's true bypass, is on, really my input buffer is only doing the job of you know, isolating my guitar pickups, giving it the loading that it expects to see, and then it's buffering just the single patch cable that goes from it to the compressor. 
everything else that exists after that would not be buffered. So in, in essence, if we're kind of, if I'm going to do a, a fictitious signal path here, if I have a buffer, right, let's pretend this is the buffer, and this is my first pedal in line, and this is always on, the only thing my input buffer will be controlling is the patch cable that connects this to the buffer. If this is always on, now this is the buffer responsible for driving all the other cables and all the other pedals after it until it reaches either A, another buffer, could be inside a pedal like a boss pedal, or another dedicated buffer, or another pedal that's turned on, and then that becomes the buffer from that point forward. The problem with that, though, is, is that most pedals, in fact, almost all pedals that I know of, are not typically designed with the idea that they're great line drivers or great buffers if it's an integrated kind of buffer as a part of the pedal or any pedal turned on having a low enough output impedance to really drive long lines effectively or stably. So the problem becomes is that you're relying on a product that's not designed to drive a long cable. And as we talked about back in our fictitious layout, our longest cable is probably from the reverb to the amp. The very last pedal to the amp could be anywhere from 10 to 20 feet. And that's probably the longest individual cable that exists on our entire rig. So are we wanting to rely on a pedal, and I'm not picking on this particular pedal, it's really this is just a, in place of almost any pedal that you can think of, these, this is designed to be a flanger. It's not usually a thought to be like, well, I need to be a flanger, and I also need to drive 100 feet of cable afterwards with no you know, appreciable loss or any tone change. This is not the, it's not the impetus of this design, as it is for almost any other pedal. So the importance of having not only an input buffer to control the pickup, the pickup so that they see the one meg that they would expect to see if you plugged into an amplifier, converts the signal to low impedance from there. Not only need that, because you're isolating the guitar from the pedal board, you also need to have the one at the end, which is the one, let me bring that up, that's the one that is driving from the last pedal the long cable back to the pedal board. And this makes it so that no individual pedal is responsible for driving too long of a line before it reaches the very end of the chain and then needs to have a nice quality buffer at the end. So what is a good quality buffer? So I've got a couple of them listed here for you. I of course have already talked about the TC Electronic Bonafide Buffer. This is the Rig Doctor's Best Buy. It's 69 bucks. It meets the criteria for what I talked about in terms of the specifications. So one meg is definitely what you want to have on the input. 100 ohms is about where you want it to be on the output. The range that I would look for is somewhere between about 80 ohms and about 150 ohms as the output impedance. But as the input impedance, like I said, one meg is the ideal because that's what your amplifier looks like. That's what your pickups are expecting to see if you want them to react the way that you're used to. So I highly recommend that you look for ones that have a one meg input impedance and between an 80 and about 150 ohm output impedance. A lot of people confuse the output impedance because a lot of companies will have like 100K. That's 10 times higher than 100 ohms. So you want to make sure that you are staying in that 80 to 150 ohm on the output impedance and one meg on the input impedance. If it's higher than that, it's going to make the buffer really bright and it's not going to be that neutral. If it's lower than that, like say 500 ohms, it's going to, or 500K ohms, it's going to be a little darker, a little bit more rolled off. But if you want the most neutral, I highly su suggest that you stay within that spec on the output impedance about 100 to 80, I mean, you know, go as far as down as 80 and about as high up as 150. But you'll see if you look around at most of the buffers, almost none of them publish any of those specs. It would be like saying that you're designing a car for safety and not publishing any of the crash test results. If you're making a buffer and you're not within that spec, that means that you are not really a buffer and that you're going to be adding an appreciable amount of color to anything that comes after that buffer. And the longer the line is after that buffer and the more cable capacitance that's seen at the end of that buffer, the more unstable it's going to become. So this is something, again, that you really need to look at. You need to have that 1 meg input. You need to have that 80 to 150 ohm output impedance. That's what you're looking for, and you want to have two buffers. You want to have one at the beginning, right when the guitar comes in, and you want to have one at the very end before you drive that long cable back to your amplifier. Now, we talked about there being some contingencies. So one thing that some people have brought up is the idea of what if you use a buffer or a wireless system like this Sure one here? Well, the Sure one does have 
a buffer inside of it. So anytime you have any sort of wireless system, that's buffer. That's low impedance at that point. If you had that, then you wouldn't need to have any sort of input buffer. You could have one and it wouldn't hurt, but you wouldn't need one if you were trying to save a few bucks. And you could just go with, say, using something like we talked about, like the bona fide buffer on the output. Now, a few other things that would be contingencies where you might not want to have a buffer, especially on the input, is on the conditions that, that you had a fuzz face. So I'm bringing a fuzz face here to give you an example. So here's the fuzz face. Something like this would not be something that you would want to have an input buffer on. You would just want to use an output buffer, something like, uh, you know, like the TC bona fide buffer that we talked about before, not that bona fide buffer. But here's some other ones I really like. If money is no object that I think are really excellent. So the sur buffer is one that I think is excellent. The cool thing about this one, especially for an output buffer, is it has an isolated output that's transformer isolated. It has a phase which is really should be called polarity, <coughs> but most people confuse this. So this will allow you to either use it as a splitter if you wanted to use that isoed out as a tuner out, or if it was at the end of your chain and you were using it as an output buffer section, let's say for example, you could use that to split out to a second amp and be able to have that uh, isolation and, uh, and the polarity switch there if you did that. Another one that I really like is by Empress. There's two different versions. There's the mono version. There's also one that's not pictured here that doesn't have any sort of boost on it, which is even cheaper than this. There's also a stereo version, which is a little bit more expensive, but that has the ability to do stereo, split. It also has controls for polarity. It has controls for the uh, isolation transformer, uh, ground lifts, etc. Another one that I really like is the Mesa Boogie uh, buffer, which is a dual buffer. This one has your input and output taken care of for you, so you wouldn't need to get two buffers like you would on the earlier ones I spoke about, like the Sure. Uh, or the sur and the bona fide. This one has an input buffer and an output buffer. It also has a tuner out and it has a boost in it that comes at the output of, uh, of the entire buffer. And it also has a level compensation for the input. So if you're switching between say uh, humbuckers and single coil pickups, you have the ability to make that compensation without making any adjustments to the buffer or having to change the tone in any way. That one is, is probably my favorite. Although the only downside of that one is that it doesn't have any isolation transformer. So if you are planning to run stereo or if you wanted to have a ground lift in some way or isolation to one of the amplifiers, uh, you'd have to either get uh, another buffer, which which in that case I would recommend the Sur if you were going to be doing a, a stereo situation, or you could go with the Empress buffer, which is the one on the right here, which already has the isolation transformer built in. But those are the only ones, and I've searched for almost everything that are in that spec that I talked about, where they go from a one meg input impedance, and in fact, the Empress one actually has a variable input impedance control. So you can actually knock it down to 500 if you wanted, or you could push it up to 2.2 um, uh, megs if you wanted. So you can get a really unloaded type sound, you can get something that's a little more loaded down, or you can get something that's totally neutral. So that ability is actually pretty cool. And you could use that stereo buffer as a mono buffer if you wanted, and you just wanted to add those capabilities. So any of those are great, and they actually publish the specifications and understand that this is the criteria for a quality input and output buffer and understand at least in the case of the Mesa Boogie and in the case of the Empress, that a dual buffer is really a necessity. Uh, and of course, the cheapest dual buffer on there that we saw that actually is a dual buffer, not just a single buffer where you'd have to buy two of them in order to do that, is the, the uh, smaller Empress on the left there. It's mono and it has the, the boost in it, but there's also actually a cheaper one that's around $100 that's got the dual buffer and it falls within that spec. Um, so that was a lot of stuff. We, we just did you know 30 minutes or so just talking about buffers and uh, I want to start kind of getting to some of the questions that are coming in um, regarding some of this stuff. Um, one other thing I think we should mention though before we get to the end of this, this is an important one that, that Mejia just brought to my attention, is there's one other condition where you wouldn't need an input buffer. You'd only need an output buffer. And that's if you had something like this. If you were using, let me blow this up really big. If you were using something like this, an EMG, uh, an active style pickup like this, this would be a condition where you wouldn't need to have an input buffer. So in sort of like our sample layout where you see that there's a buffer right after the guitar and then a buffer right before the amp, you wouldn't need that one on the input because there would be uh, basically an, any sort of active guitar 
there is a buffer sort of preamp built inside of the, the, the guitar pickups or inside the guitar itself, which is basically just moving the buffer into the guitar instead of waiting until you get to the pedal board in order to hit that input buffer. Um, you know, there's different colors on those and they can not always be the sound that you like, but a lot of people that use those pickups tend to kind of like the sound that they produce anyway. So that's just a, a caveat. If you did have a high quality dual buffer, say like the Mesa Boogie one, if it has an input and an output buffer, already built into it so you wouldn't need to get two separate buffers uh, it wouldn't hurt it if you were to use something like this but uh, a lot of people if they're trying to save a few dollars they could you know invest in their EMG pickups as their input buffer and then they'd have their output buffer it could be something like the bona fide if they wanted to save a few few dollars so when you get to these questions here there's lots of stuff coming in so let's uh, let's go for it where should we start here Mason um, there's more on YouTube. More on YouTube. There's some good ones on there. Okay, so let's uh, let's see where we started. All right. All right, here we go. Let's start with Lost Smoke. Again, if you're one of the folks that's over on YouTube, uh, or sorry, over on Instagram or on Facebook, Please join us over on YouTube because we're fielding a lot of the questions here. We will get to as many as we can here, but this is a little bit more interactive. It allows us to actually pull all the comments onto the screen so we can kind of interact with those in real time. So let's start with Lost Smoke. Uncle Mason, I appreciate the explanations you've shared in the past regarding buffers. Was there a brand of guitar cables that you recommended previously? Thanks, Chris. I like a couple of different guitar cables, and it depends on what the application is. If you just want kind of like neutral, really high quality, uh, I like the Mogami 2524. Um, you can even find those. They're linked in the description of this video that you're watching right now. I've already linked them there, so you can check those out. If you want a little bit fatter cable, I like the Belden 9778. I also like the Belden 8412, which is what Pete Cornish uses on his cables, uh, or the 8410 is another one that's really good if you want a little bit kind of fatter sounding cable. If you like it to be a little bit brighter, um, you could check out something like... Um, you could do George L's, but you would need to solder them. Um, they can sound good and, and, and be pretty bright if you like kind of like the, the, the kind of that, that really crispy top end. But um, I just wouldn't use the solderless ends on them. Uh, also, the Evidence Lyric HG, I think, is a really good cable. Um, it's a little bit brighter and a little bit more kind of hi-fi, but it, it sounds really good. Um, I'm trying to get any other ones. You know what, the best Tronics, uh, kind of like Mogami 2524 equivalent, is really, really good and super reasonable. Um, so I, I would check out those. Those are all really great. Is there one from over here, Mason, that we can throw on here real quick? Um, yeah, so here's one from Instagram by Grazer. Grazer. He's asking, why does my buffer make my fuzz face sound like garbage? Okay, your buffer makes your fuzz face sound like garbage because of, uh, well, we talked about the fuzz face is what is what uh, Grazer's talking about. So basically, if we're going back to our fictitious signal path again, pretend for a moment that this compressor is now a fuzz face. You would not want to have any buffer in front of it because it, we talked about that word a little bit earlier called impedance, meaning how sensitive is it? And a fuzz face is incredibly high impedance. And it likes to see high impedance pickups, so it likes to see the pickups of your guitar as close to it as possible and it becomes much more interactive. When you go to a low impedance output, which is what a buffer produces when it comes out of the buffer, when that hits a fuzz, it wrecks all those dynamics and your fuzz doesn't really sound anything like it did if you just plugged your guitar straight into it. So this would be a contingency where you'd want to forego the input buffer and maybe put it after the fuzz instead of having to be the first thing in line. So that's what you would want to do as far as the, uh, the fuzz face is concerned. And that would be a reason why you wouldn't want to have a buffer up front. But again, this is maybe a fringe possibility. The majority of people are probably not using fuzz faces or other transistor-based fuzzes that would be sensitive to this. Other examples of fuzzes that may not like an input buffer would be like a tone bender. Uh, certain WAs are very high impedance, especially the old vintage WAs. They may not like a buffer first. So you do... 
You can listen and find this out very easily by just trying it first without a buffer, then introducing the buffer before it, and if it does that, then you know, okay, you know what, I need to forego the input buffer and bring it in afterwards uh, after that effect so that I'm able to get the most out of the buffer and not sacrifice the tone of my fuzz. Um, another one on there that we can take before going back to our friends here at YouTube. Um, yeah, also on Instagram, John Robinish asked, for an intermediate guitar player, what kind of volume pedal would you recommend that won't break the bank? Huh. Probably the best one for the money is the Dunlop Volume X. Dunlop Volume X, I'd say. Um, all right, let's go to buffers. All right, this is from uh, Angel. Um, will you say that a buffer is needed when you use a noise suppressor? Well, it depends on where the noise suppressor is. Uh, presumably, if you have a noise suppressor and you're using a series pedal board, and when I mean series pedal board, I mean kind of like this, where everything's just one into the next into the next, there's no switcher of any kind. And typically, the noise suppressor has an effects loop in it. So you plug your guitar into the input as a send that would go into the, the, the pedals that you want to kind of keep quiet. Typically, this would be distortion and overdrive type devices. And then it would return back to the noise suppressor. And then you go out of that and maybe go into your time-based effects or go into the front of the amp from there. Or there's even people that would use the, the um, noise suppressor in the effects loop depending on how high gain the amp was itself. Uh, I, I don't... Uh, to, uh, there's a generalized answer here because I don't know your exact setup, but I would say that the buffer wouldn't be disqualified in this situation because depending on what the noise suppressor is, it may not produce that one meg input impedance, so you may be struggling matching your pickup loading so that it thinks it's it's hearing or seeing the front of an amp on the input. And then if you're just looping in your, your overdrive and distortion devices, it's going to be going out of that and presumably to other delays, reverbs, and things like that before it hits the front of your amp. And those pedals are not going to be effective enough to drive a long line back to your amp without any sort of degradation or tone change of any kind. So I would say in most cases, you would still need the, the dual buffer and that would still hold up. So it would sort of be like in this drawing where you see that there's a buffer right after the guitar and then there's another buffer that happens right, be, right after the reverb, which is the last pedal in this fictitious made up scenario going back to the amp. So uh, that's what I would say in regard to noise suppressors and buffers. Uh, I'm going to do one more here and then we'll go back to the uh, Facebook Instagram crew. Um, let's see. All right, this is from Emilio. Boss ES5 buster, buffer not, not natural sounding, too bright. Exotic Super Sweet is very good. Also, Wampler Tumnus. Okay, so... Uh, Boss ES5, I agree, is not the best buffer. If you had no buffers and it was the option between using what's on board, that switcher, or just going direct uh, with all the buffers bypassed, I'd certainly say you're better off using the ES5 than nothing. The Exotic Super Suite <coughs> is very colored. And by that I mean that it has a very distinct tone, which is different from neutral. Now this talk about neutrality in buffers and having the right input impedance and output impedance it's meaningless unless you actually want the sound of your guitar plugged directly into your amp as the reference point with which you're going for if all the pedals are in bypass now some people may not like that sound and when somebody over here asked about what buffer did Jimi Hendrix use well any pedal that's on is a buffer so could have been fuzz face could have been a univibe could have been a output section of a wah pedal um, but there's a color that people sometimes like, like Jimi Hendrix liked the sound of a long coily cable going into his Marshall, and a lot of us presume that that was because the amp was so bright that this was one of the ways that he could act to attenuate some of that high end. So some of us hear buffers, and we say, oh, we have a buffer now because this company calls this thing a buffer. Uh, to my knowledge, the Exotic Super Suite is way outside of that specification that I mentioned. So... It likely, Mason, can you look up what the, the input impedance and output impedance is on the Super Suite? I think that it actually is published um, on their end, or at least one of those is. 
And so we'll double check that and see if it kind of meets the litmus test that we that, that is for neutral. And this is not just something like I'm pulling out of my hat in terms of the number. This is something that is, if you're looking at sort of the science of neutrality and where you would need to, what the, the signal would actually need to look like in terms of its input and output impedance to produce the most linear signal possible. In other words, it's not going to be susceptible. That's a pretty accurate range that I think most people would agree on in terms of the engineering specifications that you would need for a neutral linear buffer that wouldn't be adding any color. I don't mean linear like it's stiff. It's just not doing anything. It's just taking what you put in. It's a one-to-one -one amp. What goes in is what's going to come out, presuming everything is true bypass and it's not hitting any other buffers or anything else. It's going to be able to maintain that linearity throughout. And if it's a good quality buffer in that spec, you could presumably drive like 100 feet, I would say, on average before you see any sort of instability or loss of any kind. Did you have to see it? So both the uh, super clean buffer and the super sweet booster are one meg. In 1K. In 1K. Okay, so, so in terms of the Super Suite, it has the 1 meg input, which is good. That means that they're isolating those guitar pickups. They're giving the guitar pickups what they want to see, kind of making them think as though they're seeing the front of an amp. The problem is it's on the output side. Now, it may not matter if that was an input buffer so much because if it's only driving a couple of cables before something's turned on, that may be an, you know, a, a very negligible difference. But if this were the last one, like when we talked about on our fictitious buffer uh, system here, if you look at you know, the buffer between the reverb and the amplifier, that's where you'd run into problems with that one because the longer the cable that it sees on the output, the more unstable it becomes. And it's already unstable if it's at 1K. That's like not an optimal range to be running any sort of capacitance on the output. Uh, so I would say it's it's 10 times higher than what the recommended range is, I would say, by the majority of kind of the the, the engineering community uh, that is looking at sort of what's a linear range for something that is not going, that's going to be able to drive something that's not going to have any sort of coloration of its own. So, uh, and the Tumnus is just a clone that's also in the same category of the Super Sweet, like not an efficient buffer, very colored, has a very specific tone that's different than neutral. But... You may like that sound. So that's not to say that you're wrong or that it couldn't work. It's just not the same as your guitar plugged into your amp. And it's not the criteria for a neutral buffer uh, in that situation. Let's uh, head to some folks over here. Yeah, so one I saw right <coughs> was, um, are all boss buffers equal? Are all boss buffers equal? Can you type that into the, the chat and I'll just bring it in so that way maybe it'll... Even though it'll look like it's coming from us, it's actually coming from Instagram through us. We're the conduit, the Instagram conduit. Um, let's see. All right, we're bringing our own question. Very self-indulgent. <laughs> all right, are all boss buffers equal? And who is this really from? This is, is from, from After Joey Owen. After Joey Owen. Okay. So they're all pretty much based on the same archetype and some of the boss pedals have more than one buffer in them actually most of them in fact have multiple buffers in them that are always active so you're actually not just getting the influence of one buffer you're getting a compounding effect of buffers and this is why when you have a lot of boss pedals in line it can tend to add a lot of noise floor because it's not just like you're hitting one buffer for each one you put some of them can have four buffers inside them or three in series and you compound those four in a row it's like you have eight or nine buffers ten buffers going on so they there are some differences in buffer to buffer on boss but they all are based on the same kind of um, you know FET style buffer and it's it's not an efficient way to do it uh, but I think that they're very tied to that style because it's just the way that they've done things and it's kind of just a signature part of their sound I don't find them to be, they're, they're certainly not neutral sounding. I don't find them to be a great sound. They can be okay if you got one or two here or there, but it's not something that I would rely on and say, well, I got a boss pedal in the front, a boss pedal at the end, and my buffer problems are solved. It's definitely not that sort of situation. So um, that's what I have to say about that. Uh, any other ones that we can go on from uh, Facebook or Instagram? I think as of right now, none that you have. Okay, let's go back here. Uh, let's go to our Instagram friends, or our YouTube friends. Let's see, I'm trying to go back to where I left off. 
I'm like lost. Um, okay, we talk about the super sweet. Um, all right, here's a good one. It's about acoustic. We didn't talk about this. So for acoustic guitars, say I'm running a number of effects uh, for an acoustic, a comp, boost, EQ, reverb without an acoustic preamp, and then to a mixer, would it work? I'm running long cables. Well, if you're... Okay, so no acoustic preamp. So it's just a passive pickup that's in your... Um, that's inside your guitar. I mean, so th this situation can be a little bit nuanced be depending on what... It, what how there, is there some sort of pickup in your guitar? Uh, some of the piezo stuff actually sounds better if it's unloaded. So if it's like around 10, 10, uh, 10 uh, meg ohm input. So the buffers that I'm recommending may not be ideal for this situation. And you may want to have like one of the LR bags or a, a specific preamp that's designed for an acoustic guitar because there is a certain impedance that's mated to that. And that's why a lot of them are already have their own active circuitry on them, which is basically like acting like an input buffer. And a place where you would have some benefit potentially is on the output side when you're driving, you know, your long cables back because that capacitance by that point, if you have any other sort of preamps on or any sort of effects, you're going to kind of be beholden to whatever those output impedance impedances are and those input impedances are and like I said most pedals are not designed for the idea to drive long lines so they're not going to be really efficient at being able to get those cables back without changing the tone some especially if you're not using really high quality cables they may have higher capacitance and they are quite long so that's a consideration um, but I would say if you don't have any onboard um, preamp on your acoustic guitar you may need to have some sort of outboard preamp you know like LR bags or there's, there's a bunch of different manufacturers that do stuff like that Fishman um, that you may want to consider that would do a better job matching the, the, the right input impedance that you would want to see for an acoustic guitar as opposed to a passive electric guitar pickup. Um, let's go... Um, so this is sort of along the same lines with Rob Flax. Um, so what if you have a hybrid rig where you want to run an acoustic guitar and electric guitar at the same time? Uh, piezos and buffers. I mean, the, the buffer is not going to necessarily affect it. I mean, if you're if you're doing a, uh, an active pickup of an active piezo system, uh, those potentially uh, would may already have an onboard preamp, depending on what the the acoustic guitars that you have. Like I said before, a lot of the piezo stuff that tends to run pretty unloaded compared to what a guitar input impedance would be somewhere around 10 megs. Um, so if you had one that was legitimately doing that switching, you may need to have something that has some compensation for that for that type of impedance uh, to match it up better to what you would be used to hearing. Again, like some people will do like AV switches on the input that are passive, and one runs to an input buffer that matches the the electric guitar pickups, and then the other one may go to a Fishman that has a DI out from there or something like that. So you can kind of get the best of both worlds. But you would definitely want to do some sort of treatment if your goal is to keep it really neutral uh, to that end. Um, let's see. This is Bill Evans. How many total pedals do you think qualifies, justifies having a buffer like the uh, TC electronics? Well, I would say, it. you know, I think probably any any number of pedals, really, unless it's just like one or two uh, at that point, because you, you still have all of your guitar cable capacitance, and that's really... The killer, right? There's the input cable you can't really do much about because there's unless you have an onboard buffer preamp like on active pickups that's going inside the guitar that's buffering that cable going into the first pedal. Uh, after that, you may have short cable lengths going through your pedals, but then you have another long cable taking it back. So if you're really putting together a pedal board, you're going to want to. If it's just a couple of pedals on the floor, it may it may be negligible at that point. Um, Let's see. This is back to the Klon style buffers. Um, thoughts on buffers and Klon style pedals when most are bypassed are buffers. I love the sound. I think that'll do the job as end of chain buffer. No, it won't. That's a highly colored, very inefficient buffer. I think it uses a TLO 72. And can you look up what the Klon output impedance is, Mason? I think it's somewhere, I think it's somewhere around 1K. Which, if it is 1K, that's 10x higher than what the recommended range would be. Um, yeah, so it's a TLO 72, not not a neutral chip by a long shot. Um, it has a very specific sound, 
And that's the type of thing where if it is running at 1K, which is what I, I think I think I remember it being, that one will be incredibly unstable. The more capacitance that's seen on the output of that pedal, uh, it is not designed to drive long lines, let alone patch cables without color. It's not ideal for for a signal conditioner by any stretch. Um, do we see anything on the output impedance? I mean, I'm sure it's somewhere in this. Yeah. yeah well. If we find it, we'll get back to it. But I'm pretty sure it's somewhere, you know, it, at, at best, it's it's 500, um, 500K. One, uh, I think it's like 500K, actually. It's the end point. Yeah, it'll be further down. It'll be after the gain stage. I think you might be up a little bit. Uh, well, if you find it, let me know. But yeah, it's definitely not in that range. I've done some tests on these before, and they're they're pretty inefficient and, and definitely not stable for an output buffer of any kind. That doesn't mean it can't be a cool sounding pedal. It's just not designed to do that. All right, can Mr. Spock? This is a good question. Can you describe why too many buffers is bad? Lots of pedals have buffer bypass. Yeah. So really, in the best case scenario, it's sort of like what I was showing in this example diagram is like have as many true by bypass pedals as possible, and then have a high quality input buffer and a high quality output buffer. The <coughs> the the fashionability of buffers coming back is like a, a way to have pedals that are buffered. It's it's it was a it was an overreaction in my opinion to what like Mike Fuller had established with the true bypass, which really I think is the best way to go is to have true bypass pedals and then choose the buffers, the high quality buffers, and put them in the right places, not rely on your boss T U three or any of that stuff to do any sorts of buffering because it's really not designed to do that effectively. So when I describe if you're asking me to describe what too many buffers looks like, it looks like that thing that I talked about when you have a bunch of boss pedals in series. Because boss pedals don't just have one buffer in them. They typically have multiple buffers inside of them, and it varies from product to product. So you may have some that only have two. You may have some that have four. So when you compound multiple boss products across the line, you actually end up having this effect where not only does it add a lot of noise, but it actually will decrease your output level. So you have like a you know six or eight dB drop across your pedal board with four or five boss pedals in it, and it adds the noise force. So you get increased noise, you get lower output at the end because they're not designed to. You're not supposed to be running a bunch of these together. It wasn't really the intent, and they're not designed to do that. Um, so I would say use boss pedals judiciously if you're going to use them. And that's not to say don't use them. I use a few on my rig myself. Um, and I just make sure that I use them in the right places. And if you have a switcher, then you can be a little bit more flexible with that. But uh, the over buffering thing is really a phenomenon for people using low quality buffers, understanding that not all buffers are created equal. And 99.9% .9 of the buffers that are out there are actually terrible, especially if they're built into a pedal and somehow talked about as being you know, this really high quality thing like with the Klon. The Klon is a great overdrive pedal. It is a terrible buffer. And people get confused because they, they understand the prowess of the Klon and they somehow conflate that with its ability to be a quality line driver, which it's not. It's a great overdrive, great boost, not a good buffer. All right, what do we got over here? Um, so we got one from Nikki Straps on Instagram asking, if you were to open a buffered pedal, what are some of the schematics slash components one should be looking for, looking at for a great quality buffer? Can you throw that one in here and we'll, we'll put it up on the screen? Oh, yeah. All right. Cool. All right. Again, bringing this one over. This is from Instagram. There's stuff going on in, in Facebook too, so let's not completely ignore those guys. I think we can still find them on our uh, on uh, the uh, the Facebook page. All right. So if you were to open a buffered pedal, what are some of the schematics and components one should be looking at for a great quality buffer? Um, well, I think that looking at components and schematics for buffers, you're probably not going to find many for the really 
good ones, or at least they're not going to publish them. So I don't think that that would, that would be a pretty frivolous uh, endeavor. Um, I think that looking at the input and output impedance specs that I mentioned, so looking for that one meg input, you know, between 80 and 150 um, ohm output uh, would be a good place to look. And then looking at, you know, the the quality of the company that's making the products. You know, if you're looking at a company like Empress, you know, they have a lot of really great stuff. You're looking at Mesa Boogie, certainly Legacy there. I mean, that's not to say that Legacy or, or branding is everything. Um, but typically, if you're in that range, you know, Sir, again, another really great, great company. These are, you know, these are things that I think are, are more tangible and are going to make sense to you. If you just open up a, a buffer and you go, oh, it's got a Jensen Transformer. It must be great because Jensen Transformers are great. I mean, it's not really going to tell you a lot. You can have a Jensen Transformer and the buffer could be totally bogus. You know, you can use great stuff and not have a great result. Um, so I don't, they're not necessarily, uh, you know, things that, that uh, are always going to exist together. I think the ones that I mentioned here that are linked in the product description are a really good place to start. Uh, and I have to be truthful, I really found very few that even met that criteria, and most of them aren't published. And if you're a company that's not publishing that information, again, it's like saying you have, you know, a, a highly uh, highly vetted, safe vehicle, and then you don't publish the crash test specs on the vehicle. It's like, what, 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 are you, what are we doing? You know, if you're really making a buffer, it needs to be linear, it needs to be neutral. That's the whole definition of what a buffer actually does. Um, how are we doing? Um, there's a question over here. Question over here. There's two last ones. Two last ones. Let's see. Um, let's see. Can't open these. I think that was just... Pointed signal is not degraded, but shifted and resonant. Shrinking a buffer is not what's needed, but just a choice. Not always. Carlos intended is a very long cable to get his signature sound. I'm not sure what that's referencing. Um, I think if somebody's saying a buffer is not always needed, no, it's not always needed. It just depends on what you're what you're looking for. You may not like the sound of your amp. We kind of talked about this a little bit earlier. You may not like your, the sound of your amp as is. You may like it to have a little bit more rolled off sound. And if that's the case, you know, you may not want to use... An input buffer with a, a one meg, you know, input impedance and a low output impedance. Um, but my point is, and, and, and Martin, this is something to consider. And if I were doing Santana's rig today, I would tell him eliminate all of the variables on the pedal board. Input buffer is the hard wire, a wire firewall that eliminates issues with the guitar from potential issues with the pedal board. The output buffer eliminates the output impedance of the, the pedal board, so isolates the pedal board from the amplifier. So you now you have this hardwire firewall where guitar is isolated, amplifier is isolated from the pedal board. If you want to then make adjustments from there, you can do that with the input cable. So you get a long coily cable. That could be something that could influence, darken up the tone on the input. You could then, if you wanted to, you could do something that would have a variable input impedance control, but you really want to control the variables in ways that are actually kind of scientifically adjustable. If you're just saying, oh, well, you know, I did 10 feet of cable here, and I think we're going to use a 20 foot of cable here. Like, there's all these variables that are going to be changing all the time. So the idea is, is that you've isolated the issues to the degree that you can. You've controlled for the pedal board, and then if you want to mess with external factors from there, you can, and you know kind of how to get back to neutral again. It's much more difficult if you're starting to play games on the pedal board itself, introducing different cables, introducing different things. It's always best, in my opinion, as somebody who's built hundreds of pedal boards for a lot of the top pros in the world, is to really keep the pedal board as isolated as possible, remove as many variables as you can, and have the variables that you do want to mess around with kind of exist independently of the pedal board so that they can always be changed back, so you always can get back to baseline. Uh, anything else come in over there? Um, yeah, let me... Uh, okay, we'll come back. I'll put it in. Come back to that? Okay, I'll go... Uh, Oh, this is this is the Klon one that you're talking about. Yeah. All right. So this is uh, Rui. Since we're on the Klon topic, I just purchased a Klon KTR that I'm using as a boost pedal on a Princeton Reverb. What would you recommend for a overdrive for a Klon KTR for blues? I mean, you could do the John Mayer route. You could double down on the mids, get a TS10 or some sort of tube screamer. Um, you could. Um, you could go with uh, Blues Driver. Those do really well with the Klons, too. Kind of just a different way that it sits with that mid-range. I'd probably check out one of those. 
Um, and I don't know if you're looking from a product recommendation of ours, but uh, if you specify that, I can do that. But for now, I will I will play a neutral field. Um, let's see. All right. Go back to our friends at YouTube. I can't remember where I was. I feel like we were a ways back. <laughs> <coughs> okay. Um, okay, here we are. What's the buffer situation on Isaiah's pedal board you just built? And why is there no buffer on this board? Well, there's no buffer on this board because... We were at Chicago Music Exchange on Thursday morning, and Isaiah asked me Thursday morning if we could build him a pedal board. And so we didn't have the ability to, to do that in that short time period. Um, so the best answer is it should, ha it should have one. Um, however, it wasn't like a total mess. I mean, the, the Mercury 7 doesn't have, a terrible, doesn't have terrible output impedance. I think it was... I think it was maybe like 500 ohms, something like that. So not awful, but definitely outside the spec. Um, but the steel string is also on pretty early. And then he has the buffer in the Archer, which again is not the best buffer in the world. But if it's only being used to buffer a few patch cables, it's not the end of the world. If in best case scenario, I would definitely say he would have needed an input and output buffer. But just time did not permit that. He didn't already have one. There wasn't a way to easily go and get one. In the meantime... Um, so, you know, best case scenario, yes, there should have been one on there, at least one. Um, but we'll have to do that when, uh, when we do a return visit. So that's the best I can tell you. Um, Greg Adler, wet dry. I guess you're asking about buffers for wet dry. It would be the same principle as this. Uh, so you'd have one on the input, you'd have one on the output. And then for the, for the wet, you typically would you know, there's a lot of misunderstandings about wet dry, and I've talked about this a few times. The way that the guys on the pedal show are doing it is not wet dry. That's just like a glorified splitting. It has nothing to do with wet dry. Uh, wet dry means that you're taking either a slave out of your amplifier, or you're taking a line out of your amplifier, or you're going out of the send of your amplifier, and that is then feeding uh, your wet effects, your reverbs and delays, things like that. And then you are setting those to a 100% wet or kill dry. And then those are feeding a power amp of some kind, either a stereo power amp or a mono power amp, which is then feeding cabinets. And the cabinets to the left and right, or just the single wet cabinet, is getting a 100% wet image. No dry signal comes through that whatsoever. And then in the center cabinet, that is getting the 100% dry uh, everything that's not being affected by, say, the delay or reverb. And then, so this is all occurring out of one amp. This is not where you're splitting out of the input and going to delay effects. That's just a split input situation. It has nothing to do with wet-dry. I have no idea why it's being called that. Uh, it's inappropriate for that application. It's split system or split stereo. Um, but in terms of your question of where to put buffers, you would do it the same as you did here, except pretend that there's no delay in reverb, and you would want to put another buffer going to the return uh, of the power amp. So if it was stereo, you would, you know, you may want a stereo buffer there, but it may not be necessary because if you're dealing with line level potentially at that point, um, you may not, you may not need to, to do it. But it, you know, in a best case scenario, like on an effects loop, similar thing, you sometimes would want to buffer the return depending on how effective that last pedal is at driving the line back to the amp. But if a lot of this stuff is racked like it was in the old days, um, you know, the, they, there weren't really long cables and they typically, weren't, uh, they typically weren't buffering the return. But if you wanted to say you had the most closest neutral zero capacitance uh, system, you, you would consider buffering the return from the last pedal going back um, to the power amp, or if you were going into another amplifier to be the wet, you know, say the the, the return of another amplifier head or or, or combo, uh, you may want to buffer that that cable that goes to the return. Um, let's see.
can you set input and output impedance? I guess that serves the same function. Well, most most of the I don't know of any buffers other than the Emperor Stereo one where you have any adjustment. I don't think of the output impedance is set. It's a fixed amount, but the input impedance is variable. Uh, I think it's high as 2.2 uh, megs and as low as 500. But it's not like something you can go like, oh hey, like you know, I'm just going to set my clone to, you know, whatever. Like there's certain there's certain um, abilities that pedals just don't have. Again, like if something's built for an overdrive, it's typically not uh, part of the process of designing it that you would also consider making it a buffer. Uh, I mean, you could, of course, modify it to have different input and output impedances, but that's not typically what people are doing on these. They're designing them for a specific sound that they're going for. And if they're a buffer, that's typically an afterthought and not part of the design concept in most cases. You know, this is speaking generally. Uh, what about the Goodwood Audio Interfacer? I have no idea. They don't, I don't think they publish any specifications. Can you double check that? Fact check that? I couldn't find any specifications uh, about this input or output impedance. Um, so, again, it's like saying that your car is really safe, if you're an automobile manufacturer, and then not publishing any specifications on the crash test ratings. It's just like you don't do that. You know? um, And did you, did you happen to get anything on there? I don't. I didn't see any specs. Description. Nope. Just know it takes a hundred milliamps. That's all we know. All right. Goodwood, or this is George Hunter, Goodwood has no output buffer as far as I know, which sucks because the format is great. I don't know. I it, I think actually it just said there that it did have output buffers, and you definitely need an output buffer if it's driving a transformer because most of the transformers that guys are using for isolation, if they're not driven by low impedance, they will really affect the sound pretty significantly because um, most pedals won't be able to drive that effectively. Um... This is NJ Stratitude. I use a Buffer Plus by Empress. It was before Mesa built theirs. I like the clean boost as a kicker, uh, and I place all fuzz before the buffer, and I return all the ODs and effects that aren't in the amp. Yeah, so I mean, I think you're, it sounds like you're doing what I was suggesting, where you put the buffer after the fuzz so it doesn't affect. Uh, there's no there's no uh, bad relationship between the fuzz face and, and the other stuff going on, so that's a good call. Um, let's see. Yeah, we got cut off of Instagram. All right, we're cut off. Oh, we're back on. All right, we're back on Instagram. If you're on Instagram, come join us over on Facebook. Um, or sorry, come join us over on YouTube. <laughs> the links are in the description, and you can swipe up. Um, all right, Randy, Randy Sosa, you said the buffer works only until your signal hits a on pedal. What about the jacks on a pedal board? Mine comes standard with solderless quarter inch jacks. Well, that's a separate thing from buffering. So if you weren't here for that part, what I said is a buffer is only effective so if you have your high quality buffer, it's only effective until you either turn a pedal on or it hits another buffered pedal or it hits another buffer. So that's the impetus for why you need a dual buffer system like I alluded to here where you have a buffer right after the guitar. So that controls the guitar pickup loading. So it gets to see what it wants, what it expects to see, plug it into most amps. Goes through all these pedals. You could turn any of these pedals on. And none of these pedals need to be too responsible for driving any amount of cable length because we put another one right at the end, right next to between the reverb and the amplifier, which is usually the longest cable in your whole system, so that that can drive the long line back to the amp efficiently without any signal loss. So we're not requiring any one of these pedals to have to drive you know, all of the cable capacitance plus a 20-foot cable, let's say, back to the amp. So that's the impetus for the two buffer system. And this is why you really need two buffers no matter what. If you're running any number of, of, of pedals and you really want to have the most neutral sound of your guitar plugged directly in the amplifier, and I've linked the buffers that I recommend in the description below. Um, and it is true, as soon as you turn on any of those pedals, it is going to become a buffer at that point, even if it's true bypass. 
The trick is, though, is that you want to have that buffer at the end because you're not going to rely on that pedal to have to do too much work because if you step on an overdrive, it's really designed to be an overdrive. It's not designed to be an overdrive plus drive 100 feet of cable. It's not what it's designed for. It's designed just to be an overdrive and maybe you can drive a few patch cables without starting to introduce any sort of uh, loss or RF or any sort of color or tone change. Uh, but it's not really to be relied upon to then go all the way back to your amp. So this is why you have to have that output buffer. So it sort of saves it from having to do too much work and picks up the slack there at the end of the chain to drive the long line back to your amp efficiently. Um, cool. Anything over here or should I keep going over here? Yeah, I just sent it in the uh, YouTube chat. Oh, you sent it in the YouTube chat. Okay. Jake Booker. Hey, Mason. Uh, on running something like the Iridium, how would you get your sound direct to front of house with losing any signal integrity? I don't know if on those that they're going balanced out of that or not. If it's balanced, then you don't really have much of a use for the output buffer uh, at that point. But I'm not familiar on, on, on what they're, how they're saying they're, they're going. Although some of that Strymon stuff is fairly low output impedance. Can you check the Iridium output impedance? Because they usually do a pretty good job of publishing that stuff. So it might, it might actually fall in that spec, which, which would save you an output buffer. You just need an input buffer in that case. Audio Ventress. True Tone pedals have great buffers. Well, we, I, don't, I don't think that they publish their specs, so there's no way to know. There's no way to really know. There's some things that we say we like, but is it actually neutral? What's your reference point for great? Is your reference point sounds exactly like your 10-foot your guitar cable plugged into your amp? Or is it just better than what your pedal board sounds like without a buffer? This is sort of the evaluations that we have to make, you know, and so how are we quantifying these things? Maybe they are great. I just don't know. I think I looked at it looked up their their stuff and there was no specs on it. They make a great power supply. I know that, um, but I don't know anything about their buffer because there's no information on it. Um, all right, let's see. I'm really behind here on questions. <laughs> um, all right, let's see. Uh, there's Randy Sosa. Um, Bob Kelly so Bob you would want to run input and output buffer so first thing guitar hits last thing before it goes into the preamp then it's going to go send out of your effects loop into your let's say delay and reverb and then you would want another buffer on the return after your very last pedal in the effects loop driving it back to the return of the effects loop so it would be three in the best case scenario um, but, you know, maybe you try and it doesn't make a difference, but I would try the return if you're really trying to go for as neutral as possible. Um, let's see. <laughs> Is that a cup from TJ Maxx? I think it's from Mexico. <laughs> Although I noticed they sold these at World Market as well, so maybe, maybe, maybe they're just made in Mexico. Or maybe my mom lied to me. I think I've had these since I was in college. I think my mom gave me like 20 of these cups and all of my roommates used them for years and they've still stuck with me. Um, all right, this is an interesting one. Can you use a boss pedal as an input buffer at the front of the chain and then another one at the end of the chain? No, don't do that. They're nowhere near the quality of the ones that we've linked below and that we've talked about earlier. They are not effective line drivers, and I would not recommend you do it. If you had to use one, I would say use a Boss tuner at the input, but then something high quality on the output like what I've mentioned, um, because these are not designed to drive long lines. They add noise, and if you have a lot of buffers and series from Boss pedals, they'll actually increase the noise floor and decrease your output by a number of dBs that is directly correlated to how many of them are actually in series. So the more you have in series, the less output you'll have at the end of that signal. So no is the short answer. Um, all right, Music Theory Lads. Hey doctor, what do you think about the flat cables made in Sweden by EBS? I think they're very small. They are soldered because we took one apart at Sweetwater when I was there the other week. However, I don't like the way that they sound. So they're small, they are soldered, which is good. I just don't like how they sound compared to Mogami or Canari or kind of the equivalent brands so that's that's what I think anything on there that we need to address um, we got one question okay it's kind of strange from the buffer thing but all I right in the 
Okay, I'll, I'll do one more and we'll go. Tyler Johnston. I have a preamp pedal and a 1981 DRV that is dropping volume when inside a, I guess that's some sort of looper. Before VP Junior, Tapestry, Audio Bloomery, is it possible that these pedals are reacting to the buffer? Um, I don't know. I thought that 1981 uh, one it was already buffered, but so I think that there's already a buffer in that. Maybe it doesn't like it. I mean, I would say the easiest way to do it is take them out of the loop and just try them in series and see what happens. Um, and that would kind of help you isolate it. could also be that one of those cables is bad, you know, because if you had a bad cable in one of those loops, it could presumably have the same effect. Um, so try that. And it looks like Hunter George kind of reiterated that it is buffered. Um, so, yeah, I would recommend trying it outside of those loops and see what happens. Zeke is now joining us. Zeke. All right. No, no money shot this time. No money shot. All right. All right. Yeah, Zeke. Yeah, he is doing the money shot. Sorry, guys. All right. All right. Let's see. All right. We talked about this a little bit. This is Ori Fishburne. If somebody's using EMG active pickups, it plugs into a fuzz face or one of those high impedance was, it would react as if you're using, yeah, it would, it would. Um, there's some of the active preamps that have like adjustments, but they don't go to like unbuffered levels uh, that a, that a um, non-active or passive pickup would do. So yeah, typically these don't work real well. But there are some fuzzes that actually work okay. The Boss uh, Hyper Fuzz works really well with active pickups. So some people who are into active pickups like it. Also the Sir Rufus, can do pretty well with active pickups. So if you do use EMGs and you want kind of a fuzz sound, I'd suggest looking at those. Um, let's see. All right, Ryan. Hey, Papa. <laughs> <laughs> I'm turning on my full tone OCD at Unity. Uh, volume and seeing large volume jump when I turn on my tremolo or delay pedals. All pedals in the Musicom loop switched. Why do I get this spike? Let me think of it. Okay, so turning the volume, the OCD, any volume. I see a large spike when you turn. And your tremolo doesn't have any sort of boost that it's set to do, or do you have any sort of boost engaged? Uh, the only thing I can think of is that somehow the out like the when the when the output impedance of the full tone sees those other effects, it's somehow boosting it. And and I don't I don't know if there's an internal boost on the Musicom Labs that would be doing that some sort of setting. Can you use the switching matrix maybe on the Musicom and try swapping the order and and seeing what it does? Um, even though that wouldn't be the way you would run, I'm just curious if like it, if it alleviates the problem if the if the full tone comes last or something like that. Maybe help narrow it down whether this is an impedance related issue or maybe there's something internal going on in the Musicom lab or one of the pedal or uh, sorry one of the cables in the Musicom lab maybe faulty in some way that's producing the sound. Then maybe when it's eliminating you know the the output impedance when you turn on those other pedals that maybe have a lower output impedance in the OCD, it's driving the cables more effectively and so it's getting rid of some of those problems because sometimes if you say solder the conductive plastic on a Mogami cable uh, it'll put like that like a 5k or a 10k load on the cable and then when it sees uh, a, a low lower impedance it can kind of mask some of that problem and you don't hear it as much um, so I wonder if something like that might be possible um, uh, let's see All right, this is from Terrence Smith. Hello, I have a Lely volume pedal with a buffer. The buffer in it is great. He's got his buffers, I think, as far as volume pedal buffers are fine. I don't like his, his buffers compared to the ones that I mentioned. I don't think that they're terrible. I think they're well built. But I think he has a specific objective in mind, which is a little bit different than neutral. Um, but I think as, as far as, like, his quality of stuff is really high. I just disagree on the, on the, the sound that he's going for. It's like Pete Cornish buffers... Definitely not neutral, but very well built. Um, but there's specific sound. A lot of people really like it. So, you know, if you like it, then it's good. But if you're going for 
guitar plugged into amp, it's it's different than that. Um, let's see. Okay, I got to Ryan. Uh, all right, Hunter George, how do you deal with buffers when you use a switcher? I have a PVC six X. It's from RJM with only a few before the switcher. Um, Timeline, Terraform, Empress Reverb, don't know if it's getting a buffer is, I don't know if getting a buffer is worth it. Um, so that has a good buffer in it. I think there's a couple of buffers. So you should be fine if everything's able to fit in the switcher. If there's stuff that's outside of the switcher, you may need to get an output buffer just to drive the line going back um, to your amplifier. But otherwise, I think the buffers in the RGM are actually pretty good. Um, let's see. All right, Alice, uh, regarding buffers, is the buffer in the new Peterson Strobo Stomp Tuner good? I'm not looking for the best, just something that works well and has multiple functions. It's okay. It's better than the Boss. It's not as good as the ones that I mentioned here. Um, this is a good question, actually. I'm from Argentina. TC Electronics Polytune 3 Mini is a good buffer. Yes, it is the exact same buffer as the bonafide as this one. So it has this built into it. That'll be fine as an input buffer. You would just want to get an output buffer for the very end of the signal path, driving the uh, the last, uh, from the last pedal going back to the amp, driving those cables. Um, this is EJ. Any downside to using buffers, even if they're good? I've heard guitarists like Derek Trucks who prefer going without them because they like amp splitters for fear of changing the feel. Well, I think he's just gotten used to a specific sound. I also think a lot of people, because like I said, not all buffers are created equal, some people have bad relationships with buffers because they used bad ones. And most of the buffers out there are not great. And so this produces a feeling about buffers that they believe that all buffers are the same. It's like saying, I wear a size 12 sh shoe, so everybody must wear a size 12 shoe. It's just not the case, right? So I think in Derek Trucks' situation, I think he also likes a tone that's maybe not the same of his as his guitar plugged directly into his amp. He may like he may not like the sound of let's say a super low capacitance cable that's really short and plugging his guitar straight into his amp. He may not like that sound. He may like it to be more rolled off. It doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means that he may not like it neutral. And that's that's totally could be possible. Um, let's see. I'm wondering about the input and output specs of an OBNE three band EQ buffer. I don't know. I'm sure you could look it up. If they have it published and they're one of the few, then you can know. If they don't, then it's probably not in that spec. Um, let's see. So is it better to put the bona fide buffer at the end of the chain? No, you have to have two. One at the beginning, one at the end. Unless I told you something different before. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I answered a question from before, but yeah, all things being equal, you need to have one at the beginning, one at the end. So like I showed in this diagram, you need to control the guitar pickups and isolate that from the pedal board. So you have guitar into input buffer, that's buffer one. And then you have another one between the last pedal, which in this case is the reverb and the amplifier. That's then isolating the amplifier from the pedal board. And the input one is separating the guitar from the pedal board. So those are the places that you need to have it. You need to have an input and output buffer. You want to have both of them in there. Um, let's see. All right, we're getting there. The fractal doesn't mean a buffer. It already destroys your entire signal. Yeah, if you have a fractal, you probably don't need a buffer. I wouldn't worry about it. <laughs> uh, any recommendations on how to mod pedals for true bypass? I mean, it depends on what it is. Boss ones are kind of tricky. You probably have to sacrifice your battery compartment, but there's some companies that make um, like modules that you can put in those to make them true bypass, so I'd look there. Um, let's see. Mm, uh, the RJM PBC 6X only has an input buffer. No, actually, I think it has one that is the input, and then there's another one that's connected to the insert 
that can be moved around. So you could have one on the input and the output um, just by way of how you program it. So there's more than one. Um, and let's see. Do you know anything about Kingsley pedals? A number of them are hardwire by bypass, or is that something where it's a type of buffered bypass? Hardwire bypass usually means it's true bypass, just another euphemism to mean the same thing. Um, let's see. This is Eric. What do you think of Morgan Amps thinking about the SW22? It's a dumbbell style circuit. Uh, you know, they're owned by Boutique Amp Distribution, which makes. Friedman and Soldano and Wampler and Matthews effects and Synergy. So, you know, I think that they certainly have like a really predictable way that they can make stuff that's really high quality. Um, I, don't, I think it just depends on what the Dumble vibe that you want is and what your budget is. You know, like I think you can get really close to Dumble sounds now with high quality pedals and a really nice clean amp platform, whether that's a Hot Rod DeVille or a Hot Rod Deluxe, you can get pretty close with the speaker change using the clean channel, using the right pedals, you know, like Steel String, Ultraphonics of ours. If you want to go with like J-Rocket, they have the Dude, that's a really good one. Um, you go with the Zen Drive, if you want kind of more of the overdrive tone um, of a Dumble. So there's a lot of good stuff. And, and I think I've seen more of a trend lately where people are spending less money on the amps and then being able to get more variety in the pedals because the pedals are getting so good now and are so consistent and sound great that they don't need to drop, you know, two or three thousand dollars. It's not to talk you out of getting a Morgan. I think it's a great amp, um, especially if you're doing the, you know, kind of the clean thing. Um, there's a lot of other great ones that if you're going for that Dumble vibe and you want it, you, I mean, the best, the cheapest ones are the Seriotone ones. I played one of the John Mayer clone uh, um, Seriotone amps, and it was really good. And it was like $1,200 or something like that. And it sounded incredible, it sounded great with pedals. And it was definitely that vibe of kind of like a, you know, a cheaper alternative to a, a two rock. Um, so there's a lot of different ways to, to, to do it. And I, and I think the Morgan's one of them. And there's lots of other options as well. If you want to explore it, if you want to go pedals and use kind of just like a Fender amp that's easily accessible, or you get on... Craigslist, you can get a Hot Rod DeVille or a Deluxe for $400 all day long. So definitely consideration. Um, what's your opinion on the Lely volume pedal buffers? We just talked about this, Terrence. Um, but uh, I think it, it is, as far as using it as your only buffer, not great. As far as using it as, as a buffer that's restricted to the volume pedal, I think it's fine. Um, Rig Doctor on making pedal board interfaces coming. I, I need to shoot it with uh, Mejia here. We're going to work on that soon. Um, but uh, I won't be able to get to that probably until after next week because um, I'll be kind of in and out again. Um, I got my on. Yeah, they're great, man. I did one for Tim Marco, who we did a live stream with a couple weeks ago. Uh, like did, uh, did one and kind of modded it like the one that's at our showroom. And uh, they sounded great, man. For the money, they're unbeatable, unbeatable dumbbell amps for sure. Do a really good job. Um, I think we're kind of getting close to doing an hour and forty-five minutes. Let's maybe just take any last ones that you see there that we that we should be getting to, and then we'll, we'll call it. So, you have any last questions? Get them in. Yeah, we already answered. Okay, we answered that stuff. Okay. Okay, good on there. All right, we have. I'll answer this one. So, opinion on the Goodwood Audio Interface here. We talked about this a little bit earlier, John Paul. There's no specs. There's no specs that are published on their site. All we know is that it takes 100 milliamps. And as I said before, if you are designing a buffer and the purpose is that it's neutral, the idea of not publishing those specifications is either you don't know that those are the specifications that you need to hit, which is problem one, or you're not in those specifications, so you're not publishing them. It would be like having a vehicle... If you're an automobile manufacturer, where well, you're not publishing the crash test specifications and at the same time saying that you make one of the safest cars in America. It's just two things that just don't happen at the same time. It's either, it, you, you really need to be able to, to, to talk about those specifications in a meaningful way. It's not, it, it's not just the function. Now, maybe they meet those specifications and it's absolutely great. I've only tested it for the sound purposes, uh, along with a bunch of other buffers, just to hear how the buffer sounded. I didn't evaluate uh, the actual specifications. 
So I can't speak to that. But all I can say is when I've looked, I haven't been able to find anything regarding any of those specifications on their website. All I've seen is functional uh, applications and that's and then the, the current draw. Uh, that's it. So I don't know. To me, that's disconcerting. And there's a lot of options I've published here in addition that uh, are great alternatives. I'm not saying the Goodwin one is bad. I'm just saying there's no way we can know because there's nothing that they've talked about it in any technical sense on the website or any of the literature that I've been able to find. If you can find that, I will gladly retract that statement and and, and publish it and say what it is and, uh, and perhaps include that amongst my list. Um, but to my knowledge, there is no pet specification out there. Um, okay, this is one, what is this from Instagram? All right, bass pedal anytime soon. You know, I don't know. I thought of, I've thought about it, but uh, we just got to find the right collaborator, and I think uh, I think we're on to the right track. So more on that maybe at some point in the future. Um, any chance of selling a product with an optional effects loop interface? Chance of selling or producing the optional? I, I'm just going to give it away. I'm just going to show you how to do it. It's really if you can solder a guitar cable, you can make the interface that has the optional effects loop interface. Um, so I'll, I'll make a video and I just haven't had time to do it yet. Um, what's your fa your thoughts on famous op amps for buffer designs? Uh, th these are not op amps that are for buffers. These are too colored. They're not they're not for that purpose. These are these are more for color on a distortion pedal or something like that. These are not linear, so I don't like any of these. For that for that application, if the application is neutral, these are not good contenders. You want something that is low noise and is a, a really really linear. Doesn't have a sound uh, to the degree that's possible with an op amp. Um, okay, I think uh, we've done hour and forty two. Uh, thank you all for joining us today. If you haven't already done so, make sure that you subscribe and you hit the bell icon that just keeps you up to date with everything that we're doing. I really appreciate all the people that have joined us today. I think we had a pretty good turnout. If you're on Instagram or you're on Facebook, I'd appreciate it if you go over to our YouTube channel and uh, you know, you leave us a comment, like, subscribe over there if you can, if you feel so compelled, if this information was useful to you. I'm gonna to try to bring you the very best that I can. I've provided links for everything in the description on YouTube so that you can find any of the products I talked about today. If you have additional questions or you think I'm out of my mind, you can leave me those types of comments as well in the description. Uh, and I hope to join you again, uh, doing another live stream next week. Um, so thank you all and uh, have a great rest of the week.